Our scripture this morning is taken from Psalm 53, verses one through three. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have committed abominable injustice. There is no one who does good. God, looked down, God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who understands, who seeks after God. Every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. The word of God for the people of God. Years ago, I was walking out the door of the fellowship hall when another woman came storming past me. She looked right at me and said, I'm mad as hell and I don't care who knows it. You ever met anyone like that? I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. Even if you're all in agreement with one another, you're all wrong. And that's all I'm going to say about it. And don't even bother trying to talk to me about it again. Now, the individual who voiced that opinion about 10 years ago found her purse, returned to the kitchen area, and went out the back door, and we never saw her again. And do you know what upset her so much that would enable her to permanently walk out of a church that she had fellowshiped in for 30 years? The order in which someone had laid the silverware on the table as the women were setting up the fellowship hall for a dinner that night. There is nothing or no one more wounded than a wounded ego. The greatest obstacle to a majority of humanity and to Christ's church is failure to understand our place and our personal and individual placement anywhere in this creation in light of God's place, God's judgment, and God's prevailing grace. How many of us want people to think we're right in our opinions and in our judgments? How many of us are graciously accepting when we are told we're wrong? All of us live under restraints of one sort or another, but all of us do not necessarily embrace or live under God's restraint. If your boss appears out of the blue one day and announces with other people standing around, I'd like to see you do it right this time. Unless you want to be finding new employment, you will find a way to at least appear to be accepting of the directives being given. You may find yourself driving home with a nasty case of road rage, but if you find a way to keep your composure, you will at least still have a job. How many individuals hate the holiday gatherings of the extended family in fear that some topic, some event, or some past incident will raise its ugly head? Here she comes and you know what she's going to want to talk about. How many people does life ask us to bow to? And what does that expectation do to my internal sense of who I am? and what I believe. What are my expectations of life? And how should others be respectful of me? The psalmist said this morning, every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And you and I are currently living in a world that appears to be increasing its intensity of opinions, reactions, acting out, and publicly rebelling. A good number feel justified in their responses as a personal form of retribution to the injustice they believe they are experiencing. A few years back, one of my prison disciple Bible study inmates was debating with me the passage from Mark 11:25, 25, 
where Jesus says, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. Now this individual had murdered his wife's boyfriend. He believed his ultimate confession of killing him that he only made after he was found guilty. He believed that confession then made things square with God, but that he was justified in extracting the penalty of his choice for the infidelity. Now, while this example may seem a bit extreme, what do we do with our actions and reactions when we feel wronged? How many of us understand the passage from Romans 12, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, but then do their best to extract their personal form of vengeance when they are displeased? This all goes back to our opening statement. There is nothing or no one more wounded than a wounded ego. The greatest obstacle to a majority of humanity and to Christ's church is failure to understand our place and our personal and individual placement anywhere in this creation in light of God's place, God's judgment, and God's prevailing grace. So the question, what is our place? The answer to that greatly depends on how we see ourselves. We've all heard the phrase, He's gotten too big for his britches. A lot of people outside the church keep a safe distance from the Christian community because of their perceptions, hearsay, and sometimes, dare I say it most embarrassingly, firsthand experiences. Sometimes we've encountered individuals who believe they possess all the answers or they attend the only true church or are associated only with the right kind of people or have a position of significant importance and convey an arrogance that could knock us over. Then again, we might also find a group of caring, loving, accepting individuals who are nothing like this other crowd. In the Gospel of Luke in the 22nd chapter, we find Jesus speaking these words. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like a servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. If we truly wish to overcome the injustices we believe we endure in our personal lives, we must find a way to harness that ego that so often demands our ways, our traditions, and that our opinions come first. And only then we must begin, perhaps for the first time, to see ourselves in the way Christ taught his disciples to see one another as servants. If we claim to be an imitator of Christ and then habitually seek to have things our way, we will find ourselves placed on a path of conflict and internal unrest. So, does this mean then that we are called to accept and follow the notion of everything and everyone that comes down the pike? Two weeks ago, I saw this posted on the internet. We're gonna talk about it. Pray, then let it go. Don't try and manipulate or force the outcome. Just trust God to open the right doors at the right time. Amen. Do we have the mics opened up, Russ? Good. How do we feel about that statement? How many of you like the statement? Show of hands. Most of you. How many don't like the statement? Show of hands. Undecided. 
show of hands. How many think the pastor's trying to trick me again? There you all are. <laughs> there you all go. Boy, I'll tell you, what a trusting group of people. <laughs> so looking back to our question, does this mean that we're called to accept and follow the notions of everything and everyone that comes down the pike? I believe the answer to that is absolutely no. It means we learn new ways of coping and dealing with the injustices that we see about us. Consider these names, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr. They didn't quietly accept adversity and injustice and wait for God to strike others with lightning to get the justice accomplished. They found peaceful ways that persuaded, collected, and strengthened others to become that passive resistance that would bring about peace with justice in our homes, in our places of work, and yes, even in our church, we can become that abiding peaceful presence that attracts and offers that sense of a just and Christ-like presence. Wasn't this the essential work of the one who called himself the servant in our midst? To live in such a way that challenged the status quo of our understanding, reasoning, and responses? You and I are called to be representatives of those same words and deeds that he offered. They will be found in more than our life learned responses. Yes, in the storms of life, there may be a constant air of injustice about us. Our calling is to reflect not only that which we have acquired over a lifetime, but rather that which only God's Spirit can make known to us in various ways and degrees. The deepest sign of a servant's presence is found in our involuntary thoughts, in our unspoken words, and in our anticipated deeds. In seeking justice, in a world full of injustices. May we discover ways that his ways may be seen in our ways from this day forward. Let us pray. Our Lord, we are not immune to the things that happen about us. And we are not locked away on a hillside like a bunch of monks and nuns that are totally removed. You have called us to live in the presence of all that is. And in that presence, to be your presence, to be your words, to be your mindset, to be your image and reflection. Lord, it's easy for us to want to respond when things happen with our own internal responses. Remind us of your truths and remind us that you have greater ways to bring about resolutions that can be enduring and everlasting. In a world of injustice, help us to truly seek and to find ways to be your justice, your wisdom, and your prevailing grace. Help us to become these things by the power of your spirit. For we ask these in the name of Christ our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen.